This is PodKit, episode 21, Joshua Tree, on Saturday, May 21st, 2016. And now, poor me, I'm going to San Francisco. This episode of PodKit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad, with show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk21. Hello. Hello. Hi, everybody. It's just been a little while. It has. Where have we been? Uh, quite a few places. I guess so. Uh, I guess Morris. So. Yeah. Been at Morris. Yeah, we were we were at Morris. What were we doing there? Uh, well, I think we were visiting Brian. Brian had his senior seminar presentation uh, to mark the completion of his undergraduate degree, if I recall correctly. I believe that is yes. so. Yeah. That was it. And then I graduated uh, a week ago, actually, from today. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's I'm awesome. Home and- What's funny, though, is if you um, actually want to listen to this episode, and you can do that, we recorded an episode live on site in Morris, which is really cool. Uh, You can also, uh, at that same very moment, stop listening because of dreadful audio quality. But what's (laughs) funny is on that that episode page, I put some pictures up, and it's kind of funny. The one picture with Brian in it, it's broken. Is it broken again? Well, it's broken for me. I don't know if it's broken for you. But uh, that's kind of sad. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Is... Well, it, it was in the weird format that only Google has. Right. A web app. Yeah. A web app. Only, only Google. I didn't even know that that existed as a picture format. Yogo, you only Google once. <laughs> it's got to be some tool to convert it and re-upload. I don't even know what that URL even is. It's just a pile, uh, just a big pile of, like, it looks like oh, it Base64. It probably had a bunch of session information in it yeah I bet. well i'll fix it someday but yeah that that was a really cool episode uh it was our first time ever recording outside the studio at a live event so that was pretty cool yeah. indeed and so since, and good, since good then surprise. brian you have uh you have graduated correct and you you're free now yes so i find a job but that hasn't completely started yet well enjoy your freedom but- but hopefully by the time anyone hears this episode, I will have applied to at least one more place. You know, um, <laughs> enjoy enjoy getting up at 11.45 <laughs> while it lasts. I will. <laughs> hey, well, weekends exist. That's two out of seven days. No, no. I, I wake up just at... No. I yeah, wake up true. just at six. It's just easier. Every day is the right. same. Right. I feel. I feel. I, I used to have, like, different... Uh, alarm times or different wake up times, but um, I swap I swapped it back because it's just easier. Don't have to think about it. And on Mondays, it's I'm not like, oh crap, I set my alarm to four a.m. or to to eight a.m. when I actually need to be up at closer to five. Um, so yeah. Anyhow, we've got some cool uh, stuff, and this this is going to be uh, a really interesting, I think, uh, episode because. We actually have some stories about iOS development, perhaps for the first time in PodKit history. Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty, yeah, so it only took a year. First, first off, I want to hear about, uh, Brian, your experience at Carl Hacks, uh, the hackathon at uh, Carlton, right? Yes. So this was the hackathon at Carlton. I think it was, it was April 8th through 10th mm-hmm. down in Northfield. And I drove down there with, I think there were eight of us from Morris who went. And me and another guy, Zach Litzinger, teamed up and started a beat per minute application in Swift for iOS. And made he made a cool icon. Uh, we made it's basically a single screen application um, using some ripple effect that someone has on GitHub and a little light dark theme switch. But there are hopes to keep it going in the future. So. I need to figure out how to load multiple views. So I feel like it's been a lot of trial and error and poking around, but it does work. It's on my phone and it's using a cool single uh, dimensional common filter, which another guy from Morris helped us out with. Nice. That's awesome. Evening out the data stream of taps. <laughs> yeah. yeah it, just, it looks uh, really neat. I was just poking through your source code because that's what I do pretty cool yeah it's pretty simple yeah i think half of half of the code written is all for styling 
<laughs> yeah, I, I noticed there's like a lot of boilerplate code that it just generates, but that yeah. that's that's what you know IDEs do these days. Yep. This yeah, uh, I... this this XML file here, this main dot storyboard. Oh, oh yes, that looks delicious. It looks right. a lot better when you're not editing XML. Yeah, I mean, because XML isn't <laughs> isn't what you would edit by hand, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, that was literally my week last week. Uh -huh. But um, also, the um, the one of the things that's really neat about that storyboard file, storyboard is one of the few things I do know about uh, in that kind of Xcode ecosystem. Is as as Brian pointed out, like you just you can just edit it with the GUI, okay. yep. and then Xcode sorts it all out for you. Oh it's yeah, pretty neat. Yeah, Android has something extremely similar to that. Although it's, I think it's just called layout.xml. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and it it was. It took a while to really get auto layout working with this GUI storyboard editing, <clears throat> but once once you got it, it works pretty well. Still a couple issues, mostly with flipping port um, landscape and portrait on iPad, and I think we just have it as portrait on mobile, so iPhone. But all right, all right, that's pretty cool. Well, one of the things. One of the things I want to do this weekend before I uh, head out of town is I want to see if I can get it to to build for my iPad quick and just like, cause that would be pretty that'd be pretty gosh yeah, darn. Check it out. Hey, and if you want to develop it with me in the future, let me know and we'll do. We'll, we'll do work together. So you you guys know about Swift, right? You've heard about you that bet. language. It's new. What? Yeah, that Swift. Is, yeah. I, I think I think I think it's the new one, right? Um. Wasn't there like some talk about getting Swift to um, like compile on um, Linux? Is that a thing? It's it's done. I've done it. I've got it right here. On um, my, uh... Somebody should link me like some instructions to do that, so I can accidentally port a war game over. <laughs> yes, you bet you bet. So it's actually it's really quick. I don't know. They've they've probably improved it quite a bit since I've last done it. Um, but I will I will mute myself for a bit so you don't hear a bunch of keyboard clicks, and I will get you those instructions presently. My understanding was that it uses LLVM because that's what it everybody does. loves to use. So, yeah, it does. So you have to build LLVM and then, or yeah, yeah, and then build uh, Clang, and then after that, use all that crap to build Swift. Hey, that's that's fair game because I could accidentally make a war game in C too. Right, that sounds awesome. No, it's gonna suck. Oops, accidentally. So, so, in addition to Carl Hacks, which was now over a month ago, um, I also spent some of my time updating my website, finally. So, I had been using the old Angular generator, or Ang Yeoman Angular generator, full stack, whatchamacallit. But several years out of date now, and I don't really want to maintain a full Angular website for what's essentially just a static web page. Yeah. Aside from our words page, but that doesn't need to exist on my website. So I went back to Jekyll on GitHub pages and I quite like it. It's nice. It's quite easy to maintain and good for blogging. Um, I will note that it, if you go to the URL, you'll see that it is HTTPS. Yes, I do see that. GitHub pages. So I have it loading through um, something called CloudSec, which I will link in here. So I was approached via email from one of the guys making this. I think they're a, a group of people in Singapore. And they use Let's Encrypt certs and probably route all the traffic through their servers. But it, it has so far worked pretty well for me. So how does that work? Huh. Does it use like an A name to give you... huh? Yeah, so on my DNS settings for the domain, um, let me log in so I can remember. Um, I point my brightm.me to, I think it's their IP address, and then I have a another subdomain name, so it's, an, it's like a verify that yeah. also points to their the same IP. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I mean, when you look at the when you look at the certificate, it literally says issued to Brian M. Me, issued by Let's Encrypt. That's pretty neat. That's pretty gosh darn neat. Yeah. That's for sure. So, what what is this? Is is this a, just a GitHub page kind of thing? Using GitHub pages, I yep. just have the C name mm -hmm. say Brian Me. Yeah. See that that's that whoever set that up is really smart because there's a lot of people who don't need to set up a whole VPS just to host some static files. I agree, and that's coming from me, who who could set up a VPS for a website, but 
I Great, but you don't need to, so pages. why bother? It's, yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's really nice. Yeah, that is really nice. I guess I don't I don't know if between between last podcast and this podcast, by the way, I talked about my new website. Um, but I, I have one. What is it? It is same the same old URL, but it looks very different. Really? No, not really. <laughs> um it, it uses the same sort of thing, which I think uh, Brian's got now too, um, which is, oh, look, there's a hero image and some text over it. And then if you scroll down, there's other stuff. Um, mine, however, instead of using a static site generator is actually using the ghost blogging platform, which I really liked. And I think we talked about um, on an, on a fringe episode of sorts. Yeah, we talked um, about it at some point in our lives. Whether that happened before, or after, or during this episode, we don't know. That's true. That's true. <laughs> um but I've got a couple of blog posts up there, and it's kind of neat. I use a, a font that I kind of like in some cases, but in other cases it looks kind of like uh, a little bit 1940s-ish somehow. Wait, so are you talking about the title font? The title font. I actually think that that, that fits you and your personality perfectly. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. That's, it's, that's it's, why, it's that's why very, it. you know, it's It's ornamental, but it's also very flowing. <laughs> yeah, that font's got some pretty sick flow, as the youths say. I don't think they say that. Maybe they don't, <laughs> but I just did. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. I'm probably going to swap it out, and um, I'm, pro- I'm probably going to ditch Ghost in, like, I don't know, a week or two, because um, the only two posts are there are essentially things that um, I wrote for class and wanted to give a place to live for the for the larger world, um, but I don't, I don't write enough to actually justify maintaining this though it does look kind of pretty so maybe i'll leave it as my landing page for a little while i mean i i love i love the idea of ghosts and i'm glad they're successful as far as they are Mm -hmm. um they recently did move from london to singapore for tax reasons yeah and that makes sense i mean you know why not um but i guess my biggest problem with ghosts is it's not what i wanted which was a wordpress killer i wanted a sensible extensible system to to actually make complicated-ish websites, and it's not Ghost. Ghost right. Well, just, it sounds just, like what you're, just for blogging. What you, what you might be looking for there is Drupal. No, no, because if because if I was looking for Drupal, I would also find a grave site. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Um, you can, you can Drupal left and right until until the end of days, if you if you wish. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I also then have a new website. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, I, I do, and um, you know, I think it has uh, some strange strangeness about it because when you go to it, there's only one link on it, and it brings you back to the same page, and it's kind of a joke because the website's name is contextual dot link, and you can click on contextual dot link, and you go back to the same place. That's awesome. Uh, so I bought this domain because I. I I am I'm I was bored one night and I thought hey you know five dollars a month for a digital ocean droplet server thing good deal why not because I, I I wanted something to play with and so you're, uh, yeah, so you're you're paying five dollars a month to host contextual dot link yes <laughs> <laughs> all right well if it's also like a playground then it makes more sense yeah so I wanted I wanted a um a a, a VPS that I could tinker with that isn't running production code, so the Nexus and my personal website and those other various things. And I was also able to set up Nginx on this server, whereas um, because I'm using Apache on the old server and some of WordPress assumes that only Apache exists in the world, unfortunately, um, this server was very much easier to set up Let's Encrypt for. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I'm I'm really glad to hear that you picked up one of those uh, DigitalOcean droplets because those are like, that's one of my favorite things um, that I've discovered so far. I know that people like Linode a lot, um, and I I can see why. But um, but DigitalOcean is really neat for me because of how like how how much a droplet is kind of almost viewed like a container and how yes. quick and easy it is to set up. It really is. Um, yeah. And that's and well and ironically you're coincidentally perhaps one of my DigitalOcean uh vps is is actually a docker host um yep. which makes things really easy because if i just want to make a new docker host i can do that uh use it for 20 minutes and test some stuff out and then delete it so i don't have to 
buy buy five dollars a month of it necessarily if I if I'm only using it to test out one little thing. So yeah, I I, I really I'm hoping to yeah you go to probably DigitalOcean because I it. think the five dollar a month one would be enough. enough it is to wrap two Docker images of my weather bots because I would like to move them off of Heroku so they can be up twenty four hours a day rather than just eighteen. So one, what I'll say is the one of the reasons I picked DigitalOcean now rather than another Linode is because it's cheaper, of course, right? Ten dollars versus five dollars—that's five dollars different. But the reason I picked Linode uh, a year and a half ago is because Marco was a big fan, and um, everybody likes to copy Marco. Mm-hmm. But the other reason at the time uh the the infrastructure for Linode had just been upgraded from whatever their old one was to the new solid state uh Xeon slices they have now and I really right. like that big upgrade and I, I felt at the time that for 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 what I was paying for I was getting a really good deal um because DigitalOcean was also sort of newer at the time so yeah. uh Linode had been tried and true whereas Dio was somewhat new so going down this route was nice uh, I will say that I'm I'm on that five dollar deal right now, and it almost seems as responsive for pretty much everything. Like you can right. you can hit it, and it and it, it's it's very fast. For sure. You know, it's it's only one core and only has 512 megs of memory, but it's still very fast. Nice, nice. Yeah, I've I've had precisely zero complaints with uh, with DigitalOcean. In fact, it's really yeah. Exactly yep. as you described, super responsive. Yep. Uh, sometimes and almost often more more responsive than sometimes the the uh, machine that I'm using, which is uh, like the the machine I'm using to access it, which is pretty hilarious. Yeah, that's kind of the point of VPSs, isn't it? I think so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's also kind of cool that that um, that that VPS I have from Dio is in New York. Right. So, so now I've got one in New York, and now I also have one in Houston. So all I need one in is one in California, and I'm set. <laughs> On all coasts. Yeah, exactly. It's pretty great. Yep. So uh, do you really want to hear about my work, or do does nobody care? Uh, I'd be interested, but maybe maybe we want to move that down to when we're talking about um, Agile. Good. Let's do that. All right. Okay, let's talk about uh, new MacBooks. How about that? Yes. So a little while ago... Um, Apple released some updates to their MacBook, uh, what some uh, in in our neck of the woods have referred to as the MacBook One. Um, this is a 12-inch one that's really tiny, smaller than the MacBook Air for some reason, um, and has no fan, has a Core M processor, and a bunch of other stuff that makes it a really neat um, kind of successor to the Ultrabook, I guess I would say. Because it's not even really an Ultrabook. It kind of is an Ultrabook, but it, it, it doesn't fit that moniker. It's just really. tiny. It's just tiny. Um, and one of the things that I thought was really interesting is over the past couple of weeks, I've seen tons of these at work, like a ton. Um, really? Yeah. Yep. Uh, generally not in the hands of developers or people who do development 100% of the time, but even, even some of those people I've seen do that, but that's because most of their work, um, is compiled and run on servers anyhow. So your, mm-hmm. your local, uh, the power you have on your local dev machine doesn't really matter so much. Um, but the trick is, it's still running Core M, which is why I'm not getting one. Uh, because uh-huh. I know, I know, I know, and I really, I really need to because um, I'm going to uh, lose access to my MacBook Air that I've been using for work for a little while, um, and uh, I want to have something that that actually can allow me to like do stuff and is not uh, almost 11 years old now, like my MacBook <laughs> is from 2007, 2006. Uh, love that thing, and it actually holds up surprisingly well despite its age. But um, what yeah. OS does it run? Uh, it's it's got uh, um, still up right? LCAP. Really? It runs LCAP. Yep. And it's a 2007 MacBook. Yep. Yep. Wow. Is it a Pro or just normal? Uh, so it was the first unibody one. I'm pretty sure it's 07. That would be 08. Oh, okay. I guess it's not a years old one. Hmm. 13, 13 inch MacBook. Yep. Okay. So I have the same one. Yep, because that's that's the la- that's their first, the oldest MacBook they will run. Okay. Yep. So w- when when we get the next one, which I'm pulling for, uh, oh. uh, write it down right now. Uh, OS ten dot twelve Joshua Tree. Yep, <laughs> that's my guess. Uh, sounds good to me. Yeah, and and everyone will call it Josh Tree because that's what that's what you have to do. Um, Wait, we have to. Is the is the dot tree a domain we can you can buy? No, I think it is. I think I'm pretty sure. 
Okay, let me let's look this up. It, hover doesn't offer it. Namecheap is loading on it. Um, okay, maybe I lied. Gandhi is probably still uh, being DDoSed, so who knows? Okay, well maybe it was just a concept. That'd be pretty awesome if it didn't. I don't think that tree is a okay. is a actually, but I can get college or Josh dot college for eight eighty eight. Like that's relevant for us. So so um, uh -huh. you mentioned that this uh, MacBook has Core M again, and yep. What why why is Core M just so awful? Uh, so the thing is, from what I've heard, I don't think it is. I think it might be awful for, for the three of us to use, but, um, I actually have used a, a, a MacBook of that size a number of times. And when it powers a nice big display, um, it's actually, it's actually pretty snappy, um, for web browsing and other tasks like that. I think to compile anything, uh, it would probably be pretty, pretty not so great, but, um, you know, I, I don't know of it. Out of everyone I know, and these are these are people who have like leagues and leagues of tabs open. Um, not a single one has. I, I I had to ask them, is it slow? And every time they've said, no, not really. Um, no, so I think, I think not really, and not no really. are different answers. That's true. That's true. So um, um, well, last year, when the first generation was that only last year? Last year, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, when the first generation Core M's came out, the equivalent performance was a 2012. Uh, MacBook Air. Uh, so mm -hmm. 2012, but it would have been what? It's, uh, is that Ivy? No, it's yeah, it's uh, Ivy. That's Ivy. Yeah, yep, that would so, be Ivy. So, so an an Ivy Bridge equivalent of last year. So this year, it's probably a 2013 MacBook Air, which would be a what? Uh, that would be uh, Haswell. Haswell. Yep. Probably came out. That's later. that's my MacBook Air, which is why I'm a little bit like. Maybe I should get one, but no. So um, I will say I use my MacBook Air all the time, and mm -hmm. unless you're compiling Xcode stuff on it, it will do everything from 2011, everything just fine in terms of, you know, Node and Ruby and Python and pretty much really anything, actually. Um, right. It can even run a VM. There's no problem there. But I guess when I'm spending $12.99... I could just accidentally spend 800 more and actually get a real computer. See, that's that's where I'm at too, right? Because um, I, if, if this is actually as equivalent to my 2013 MacBook Air, as it says, I, I've never had a problem with the MacBook Air other than the fan sometimes will will turn on when I'm compiling. Um, like one time I, I compiled Nginx from source just for just for fun. Um, <laughs> and uh, and when I did that, it, it um, I did this in the middle of a Seaside class. Um, and, uh, everyone was like, what the heck is going on with your computer? It sounds like it's going to take off. And I was like, nothing. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's the only thing, right? I'm like, ah, oh, I really want something that if I, if I'm going to drop the cash on a new MacBook, I want it to be better than what I have now, not roughly equivalent, but also smaller. So, I mean, I guess, I mean, I, I, I recently was at a Best Buy and I got to pick one up and tinker mm -hmm. with it a little bit and, it's really nice. It's it's quite sure. quite a nice laptop. If it didn't cost how much it costs, I could recommend mm -hmm. it to more people. Like if it was, you know, a thousand dollars or if it was maybe nine hundred dollars, it would be fine. I would be okay mm -hmm. telling people, yeah, it's a computer, it's really nice, go use it. Mm -hmm. But I feel like I personally need a little bit more power and I don't want to pay twelve ninety nine for that not more power product. Right. So I would pay twelve ninety nine for an i five. Where's the i five? Hand it over. Yep. Yeah. Um. So basically, I've been talked into purchasing a um fifteen inch MacBook Pro. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When they get upgraded, or yeah, now? When, when they get upgraded. All right. Same. That's what I'm getting to. So. It's a good computer. It is a good computer. If my MacBook Air could last five years, a fifteen inch MacBook Pro with uh, Sky Lake can also last five years and I'll be fine. Yep, My yep. four-year-old Ivy Bridge 15-inch MacBook Pro is still going very strong. I am amazed how well it's holding up because, yep. you know, I had my my is the high-end 13-inch MacBook Unibody from yep. 2008. Same. And that, by three years, was enough to make me pull my hair out. And so that, that lasted me four before I replaced it with my you know, MacBook it's Pro. you know a combination of having a good processor, 
plenty of memory and a solid state drive really makes a big yes. difference. Absolutely. Indeed. Yeah, so I, I I had pretty much the same experience to, to you, Brian. Uh, I had an 08 uh, MacBook, Unibody MacBook, top of the line. Um, and then I upgraded the RAM a couple times. Uh, no, I upgraded it once because the, there was the unofficial max you could get of like 8 gigs. Um, Mine was 4, and that's what I ordered my computer with. Right, same here. And then I upgraded mine to 8 because there's like a way that you can get it to do that, and I really needed that. Um, <laughs> that probably helps a ton. Like, there's a way. There's a way. <laughs> there is. Uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I don't know how official it is. It sounds like it's not. That I think official. the motherboard just supports it, and Apple doesn't for some strange reason. Right. Right. And then I also swapped it out with an SSD, uh, and that was pretty neat. So I think it's rocking a Samsung two two hundred and fifty six gigabyte one. Okay. Um, so I'm I'm still rocking the original hard drive. So that's probably why yours runs so well compared to mine, at least. Yeah, I've, I've I upgraded the hard drive a couple times on that one, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, it's still I can, it's still usable. I, I use it for Google Earth Flight Simulator occasionally, which is fun. One of my probably my favorite video game ever. But yes, when the new MacBook Pro comes out, I'm going to be all over that. Okay, real quick. so I, I've got some questions about that new MacBook Pro since we're here, and you know, might as well. Right. Um, uh, there were rumors earlier this season that the new MacBook Pros would be redesigned physically, also. So yes. is that still happening? My guess is yes. Okay. Um, I think that's probably why they haven't uh, unveiled them yet, is my guess, mm -hmm. uh, and why they're going to wait till WWDC for it. Yep. Okay, so the other rumor was that they, they, they would be price dropped a bit. Do we still think that's happening? I doubt that. Okay. Is I there a reason anything, we doubt? It's going to be, I, I'm guessing, if anything, it's going to be minimum of nineteen ninety nine. Well, what, 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 what about across the line? Oh, across the line. I bet across the line there will probably be a price drop, yes. Because to me, it's weird right now. So I'm looking at the uh, specs here. Twelve ninety nine can get you into a 13-inch MacBook Pro that is mm -hmm. also, incidentally, the same price as a MacBook. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And one must wonder, why? So if they did drop the price, I don't really know where they would go. I mean, this, this umbrella here is, is a really nice umbrella. We will just have to wait and see. I haven't been uh, on edge too much about it all because, first of all, I'm not planning on buying one this summer. But also, I'm curious just to see what it is, and I don't know. I'm on the edge. I guess, I guess me not needing to buy a computer is why I'm so yeah, stressed. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, you know, technically, I don't need to buy a computer either. I have a computer at work that I use for work, mm -hmm. and I will never bring it home because it's not very good. And mm -hmm. um, we asked, you know, hey, can everybody get MacBooks in the office? And they said no, because they don't have twenty five hundred dollars to spend on everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I, I mean, I guess I could just just bring my own, but I, I don't want to. I'm just going to use it for myself. It's mine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't really need a computer because I don't really do anything outside of work anymore. But I want a computer that that I can use anywhere. And that's good. Yeah. All right. I don't use my MacBook Pro that much, really. Right. But it's really nice for things like going to Carl Hacks. Exactly. Oh, I, have to, I have a powerful computer that's not, you know, that can actually run things and yep. has a 15-inch display. Yep. Well, right. let's move on to what's next. Right. So I guess one, one of the reasons why all this stuff is relevant for me is because um, I'm starting a new uh, internship over the summer uh, in a little bit, which is really cool. And I'm going to be doing, uh, among other things, some cool stuff with React Native. As a result, I've been kind of brushing up on uh, React Native and um, trying to figure out it uh, figure it out a little bit more in depth. Now, over the past couple of weeks, I've been working through the Getting Started tutorial. Um, it really only took a couple, maybe a couple hours, uh, plus some time to like try all their stuff out and see if I, what I could get working. Uh, and the getting started tutorial is pretty neat. It's actually essentially what uh, you, you get the framework for it when you initialize a React Native project using their command line interface. That's uh, neat. The trick is, yeah, right, right? It's really cool. Um, and if you haven't run into React Native yet, essentially it's the same sort of uh, workflow in a lot of ways as building a React.js um, app, React.js being Facebook's front-end framework of sorts that really only provides the view layer, but sometimes people can uh, incorporate other things with it, and it, it provides both the view and um, routing and some other fun stuff uh, to build a more complete application. 
Uh, but React Native is like a component that you can use to build iOS and Android apps out of it. Which is really um, handy. Right, right. And it uses like Cordova um, to make that happen. Cordova being a pat- the Apache Foundation's uh, thing that used to be called PhoneGap, I think, that would allow you to use web technologies to build apps. It, it is like really slick stuff and it works almost like magic. Um, does it, is it a web wrapper essentially? <laughs> or does it's it use... Not- it's native. not. It uses, it uses native controls, I, I believe. I believe. Okay. But though you're right, because if it's using Cordova, I guess I guess I should do uh, do a little bit more digging into it. I believe it it does use um, native UI widgets of some sort. So they they have all these components, and you you define these components in like XML or in an XML ish format. Um, mm-hmm. So like there's a slider component, and the way I understand it is that it uses the native slider UI component on iOS and the equivalent one on Android um, to to make that happen. And I'm using component there when I probably mean like interface um, element, uh, but okay. that's because React has got into my brain and everything's a component now. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, the, one of the tricks that I ran into though is that it's really difficult to go past that getting started tutorial um, just with that one initial tutorial. Yep. So like I built a little app that displays a list view of stuff, but I can't actually make actions on that. Like I don't know how to um I from the tutorial, I couldn't figure out how to uh like add a button or make that list item clickable so I could get greater detail. Mm-hmm. It's just like a list of stuff. Yep. And that's that's all well and good. Yeah, uh, because mm-hmm. Well, I was going to say that when I was learning React last summer, the the thing I ran into was that, you know, they had just a basic tutorial on their React regular website, and then mm-hmm. it kind of just left you hanging there. Like, how do I actually build something that I want, not that just you told me to how to build? So right. they, they don't really give you a good foundational framework to build things with it. They just, here's the code, good luck. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like the API documentation too is like, well, these are all the parameters you could pass to this component to make it happen, but it doesn't actually it doesn't actually show you what are necessary or what's the minimum number of things you need to do in order to get any component running. Yeah. And like that's a thing that's a thing that I feel like jQuery does really well yep, and other definitely. other other ones do. Like I feel like Ember does that pretty well too in Vue. Well, like, you know, so I mean, I guess one of the things that differentiates those things between my understanding and reality is react seems and has been for me always this more obscure thing. Like, uh-huh. the, like uh, I get reactive on how it works. You know, it, it watches for state changes and then it changes the DOM when those changes happen. That's it. Yeah. But that's it. And there's all of the stuff just to do that. And generally, that's not all you want to do as a person. Now, right. jQuery, it can let you change classes. It can let you show and hide elements. Um, Ember can let you manipulate models. And uh, Vue can show and hide. It can iterate through lists. React doesn't really do those things unless you force it to. Right. And it's it's a lot more uh, obscure. Agreed. Hmm. Agreed. And that's kind of what I'm trying to suss out, I think. Because it's... You're right that it's it's definitely it's definitely just the view and the MVC um, kind of paradigm, right? But it's it doesn't even always feel like it's a very great view. No. It's like a sort of partial view, right? Um, but um, I guess the next thing I found to try and try and remedy that was they had they listed this thing as like oh well if you're looking for a tutorial on how to build a, a larger app we've got this this other next level kind of more advanced one that to show you how to build a full app. The trick is it's really more like a design philosophy document than. Yep than anything else and um it, it's also like really out of date it uses parse right which if you remember parse went under a little while ago and they open sourced it but yeah like this is strange to me because i can't like as a new developer i'm like well why why would i want to why would i want to use this service that doesn't exist um and that's that's all well and good too and i guess another thing i noticed too is that there's a huge reliance on this whole like facebook ecosystem of javascript tools um like flow which allows you to like statically analyze your code for uh like it, it's like a linter plus uh plus debugger of sorts uh nuke Lide, which is their layer on top of atom which is github's text editor uh react and react native of course which we just discussed hhvm uh which is their um php their php yeah, environment which is pretty neat uh jest which is their testing framework 
uh, and it's all like it's cool in in the in the sense that they that they've given you all these tools that you can use to ostensibly build something sort of really neatly. But I also don't feel fully like any of these is actually well documented enough yep. that I feel comfortable using any of them. And they so it's, it's an entirely new like ecosystem of tools and. They just shove it all by you and say good luck, kind of a thing. It, it, that's 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 what it, what it feels, feels like. like. And what's weird is that we know actual companies have actually developed actual products with this stuff. Yeah. Right. So how did they do that? What do they know that we don't know? And where are the docs? Where are the tutorials? Exactly. I, I where believe, is everyone? I believe TimeHop uses React Native, and I follow a guy who is in charge of implementing that. If you uh, want the Twitter handle of him. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Because like, it's so, so Ryan is exactly right. It's like, well, I know people have done work with this, but I just don't feel like that any of that info is really out there accessible. Right. And I guess the other part to it too, is anytime I look at any docs about React or React Native, it almost always uses like ES5. or <laughs> And or it's something. a year and a half old. Right, or right. Two. Or I look up, or I look up some some like helper function they use, or some transform function that they describe, and it's like, oh yeah, we deprecated this, Oops. and it's like, well, like how how the heck is anyone supposed to learn any of this? Yeah. Um, I in like a really basic sense, I think it works really well, and I you know I got it set up so it could consume a little fake API I built, yep. um, a, a little React app to do it. But with React Native, I'm just kind of almost like at a loss for how to continue. But I'm gonna dig through some more stuff and see what I can find out. You know, um, because it is really neat, and I'll probably be working with it pretty soon. I think I think it's a great great idea. I know some of the people, um, like Tom, who made React and React Native, and yeah. Tom is a smart guy. He made Mutuals, really great. But somewhere along the line, the code was so good that somebody stopped caring about normal people. Right, right, yeah. That's that's the trick. Um, they just need some more dev angels around it, and then we'll, we'll be fine. <laughs> so a funny thing about um, uh, about React overall is that I just just received an email last night that the upcoming JavaScript Minnesota event on React is at capacity. That's true. And that is true. I don't know if that's yeah. ever happened before. Has that happened before? So um, it has happened before. It hasn't happened in a little while, but there there's an we've the in the organizer slack we were talking about how like awesome it is that we have so many people but we're actually not sure the fire department uh or you know the fire marshal's regulations will allow us to have any more people there yep. um so we we had to we had to shut it down so i updated my rsvp to give uh, other people another slot because yep. i'm uh unfortunately kind of stuck uh well you're not stuck poor, you're poor willingly going poor me i'm going to san francisco oh, it's gonna poor, be awesome poor you <laughs> um, it is going to be awesome, but I won't be there. I'm going to be hanging out with uh, a couple of my really cool friends from Twilio uh, at their uh, Signal conference. Um, I'm going to drink lots of coffee from fancy San Francisco coffee places um, and uh, run around Yosemite even. And uh, you can find all that on Twitter, which I will give you my Twitter, Twitter handle at the normal spot at the end of the show. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I could talk a lot, a lot about React and... You know, it would be cool. So uh, some of the people from work are going to that React meetup at JavaScript Minnesota. Yeah. Oh, awesome. So it would be kind of cool afterwards to see what they say about what they learned there from that night and, you know, their own research and stuff about this. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That would be super awesome. Uh, I mean, yeah, you, can tell I'm, I'm... It, you can tell it's in demand. 160 people want to go. Right. Are are you gonna go? I am Ryan? going. I am registered. I am. I I accepted two weeks ago. I will be there. All right. Awesome. Say say hey to uh, to Randall and the gang. I will. I will there. tell him that you said hello from all the way in California. Yeah, and he'll be like, "That guy's a loser," and I'll be like, <laughs> "Yeah, sorry." Yeah, he didn't show <laughs> up again. I probably should have remembered about JavaScript Minnesota back when I was in Morris, so I could have RSVP'd, but. No. I mean, you could still RSVP, Maybe next month. but you might just be on the wait list permanently. <laughs> yeah. Well, we will put the video up online, I believe, if if Randall can operate the video equipment, which I bet he can. Um, cause yeah, yep, yeah, we got it all sorted out. Good. So this should be this should be good. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, do you want to talk about work now? Sure. Sure. Okay. So uh, I think when I talked about work last, it was like week two or something. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so now this is week eight for me. So that's, I think that they call that two months. And yeah. um, I'm on a new team now. I used to be working on a uh, pharmacy application for, uh, like, it wasn't, I don't know if it was really a pharmacy, but it was prior authorizations. So it would help you or help a pharmacist know if you were supposed to get a drug or not. Now mm-hmm. I'm working on a different, different pharmacy application that has to do whether or not um, you're taking too many drugs and you're trying to game the system. Mm. So I, uh, the roles have been reversed, uh, one can say. But I'm not here to talk about pharmacies. I'm here to talk about code. So uh, we're running on a fresh, newish Java stack. We are running on Spring Boot, which is Ooh, the latest nice. and greatest springy Java framework for building REST API and web services. Um, we're using a micro ar- a service architecture. So each, so, you know, you know, you can imagine some endpoints, right? So, uh, there might be a messaging API. There might be a, um, user's API. There might be a, um, uh, like a, an NTT API for drugs and pharmacies and pharmacists and, uh, vendors and, 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 you know, things in the business domain, uh, there mm-hmm. might be a file API. There might be there might be all these individual APIs. Well, each one of those API endpoints, those are all controlled by one service, and that's really cool because if any in particular service is getting hit heavily, we can spin up another EC2 instance and add more capacity to the system anytime. That's beautiful. So that's super what you gotta do. cool. Um, and so I uh, I am currently writing the user management service which means we have an api to user management pretty pretty exciting nice um, so, so out of curiosity yeah go uh, ahead. If, you, if you want to share I, I it sounds like you're not really using S- spring for the ui but have you ever run into spring webflow at all i have not actually run into that but i was looking at it last night after you mentioned it and it's kind of funny so if if um if i think if somebody on my team had actually known about that we might have ended up using it right so um, we, we, we don't use Spring itself for the UI. We use Spring Boot just to, you know, hold our routes and our endpoints. And then we use Timeleaf as our template generator. And ah. we, have, we have a very minimal front end because the company, the, the, the client we're working with, their, their end goal is for us to make them not only an application layer, but also a platform layer. Right. And the application we're making is a, a demo front end, basically. Uh-huh. So it's full functionality. But it's sort of a demo because their dream is for all of these microservices to power a platform and the API can then be used by their clients to design their own integrations and their own applications with the platform. So we're, 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 we're making the Twitter of drug tracking. Hmm. Um, so on the front end, which I was helping work with, we're using Knockout JS uh, with Bootstrap, so everybody loves Bootstrap, of course. And Indeed. this is Bootstrap three. Bootstrap three is fine. I know everybody hates Bootstrap three, but it's okay. Stop hating it. Foundation isn't bad. the answer. I'm waiting for so Bootstrap four. <laughs> yeah, I, I am also waiting for Bootstrap four. Um, it 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 is very promising. Hopefully, it'll come out one day soon, and everybody can use it. Uh, Knockout, on the other hand, is not something that I personally would have ever picked because Knockout's old. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it does have some cool stuff. Pretty neat. Uh, you can map in and out data fairly easily using a couple of Knockout plugins. And and overall, it, it's, it's good enough for the minimal amount of API work that is needed on this application front end. Um, one of the bigger things, though, is not that I have to deal with it, but somebody has to, is the ARIA and ADA compliance. So it has to be accessible to everyone and every screen reader, and everybody has to be happy. Uh-huh. And I know Bootstrap has pretty good support for that built in, right? It, apparently right. they do, which is it's really supposed- nice. Yeah. Now, with that said, um, so let's say you want to, um, you know, delete something, right? Well... Right now, apparently the current pattern in our application is to, to hide the box where the button that you just clicked was. So if you were, if you try, were trying to hit the delete button in a list of something, it should hide that box, pop up a new box that says, are you sure you want to delete so and so? 
Yes or no? Yeah. Well, to me, that's one of those modal box operations. Like, it would just darken the screen, pop up the modal, and ask, hey, do you want to delete this thing? Yes or no? Because right. it's not like you can do anything else while you're doing that, but it doesn't take yeah. you out of the contextual place you were. Right. And so I feel like the current established mechanism for doing this operation is sort of broken right now. So I'll complain to the right person and hopefully we'll get it fixed. Right. So you, what you're saying is it, op- it, it pops up a new literal pop-up window to No, it, to doesn't, do that? Pop up, it doesn't pop up a pop-up window. Um, but, you know, like, you know how, like, they have, um, uh, you know, how you can, like, make a, a box out of a div, you know, the, the background's gray and the box part yeah. is white. It's like a card. Yeah. Well, they hide yeah. the one that you originally were in, t- they take away the list, and they yeah. show you yes or no just in the middle of the screen. And it's like, why not just use the Twitter bootstrap yeah. modal? Why? Bootstrap already has a modal for that, for that very reason. And in fact, it's it's funny you mentioned that because on one of the apps I'm working on, as I as I tidy up um, this one intune chip, uh, is is essentially entirely bootstrap modals. Like yeah. that's that's how every operation is done. You push the button to to say yes, I'd like to renew this, and then uh, a modal pops up that says, "Are you sure this is all the info about it?" Are you sure this is the one you want to renew? Are you 100% sure? Yeah. If so, click the big green button and that's it. Yeah, exactly. And I, I feel like the, the model would be really nice. I would be a big fan of going that way. Apparently somebody, it was rumored when I asked the, the person who was doing UI work before me, so how come you're not allowed to use modals? And, and the guy told me that, well, it has something to do with accessibility. And I'm like, uh, I don't know about that. Yeah, Bootstrap, hmm. Bootstrap has... Uh, support for that yeah you so can, I, don't, I don't know what the i don't know what the deal is i have to investigate further i have uh somewhat non-fond memories of working with bootstrap models uh spring of sophomore year and mm-hmm. i was trying to make a, a login page that looked like a modal but wasn't actually a modal so it didn't it wasn't hovering over it was just all the styling from it but i was trying to pick apart bootstrap and you know overriding styles and mm-hmm. it was bad that's my two cents on models and bootstrap. <laughs> yeah, sometimes sometimes they can be all right, but yeah, you have to you have to structure it exactly how bootstrap wants you to in order for it to. I mean, I think I think my 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 the best part of the modal for this is it's asking yes or no. We're mm-hmm. not doing additional info. We're not doing any secret scrolling. It's yes, not or, a form. yes or no. Yep. Uh, so um, uh, I'm on a twelve person team now. And it, it's kind of a big team for Scrum. And uh, we have varying experience levels. So there's SE1s, 2s, and 3s, and an application architect, and a project uh, product owner, and um, a manager. Uh, so it's pretty cool. But yeah. it, but again, it's a big team. Our daily stand-up takes 15 and a half minutes. <laughs> yeah. St- stand-up discipline is a big issue in our group because yep. there are usually... It usually it turns into an, an information uh, an information sharing thing, really. Yep, and then and then you know every other person has to make a pun, and you know how it goes. <laughs> oh yes, well yep. we all must make a pun. That is that that's uh, the first question in any agile stand up. What is your pun, <laughs> and what prevents you from making those puns? Any roadblocks? Any roadblocks? Yes. Exactly. <laughs> so you know I, I I really like working on this, and I, I like the team a lot. Uh, now, am I learning a whole lot of stuff here? No, not really. Like, I'm learning about the Java stack. I'm learning about, you know, the tools and the methods. But am I learning anything I haven't seen before? No, not really. I mean, I've I've used a database before. I've used models before. I've used REST services before. I've used a front-end framework before. I've used mm-hmm. Bootstrap before. I've used Ari before. I've used ADB, ADB before. I've used, I've done all of this. So. Yeah. I'm okay with everything, and I, I've really had a lot of fun helping other people do the things that their groups need to help with. Yeah, Good. that's awesome. That's what that's that's the name of the game. Yeah. So we that's can uh, we can investigate what I'm doing in September when this project is done. So right. that'll be pretty cool. For sure. Yeah. Nice. Eight sprints cool. left. <laughs> nice. Good luck. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm on the last sprint in in my group. Woo! Um. And it's it's going to be it's going to be quite nice. We're going to have an app that I've been working on for almost a year uh, is going to mm-hmm. is going to get some new life, which is pretty neat. And um, a bunch of other cool stuff is going on that I will uh, that hopefully you all listeners will see this 
uh, in action sometime in the near six to eight months future. Um, and you guys will tell you more about it uh, when, when we're not recording. This yeah. is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Sounds good. Uh, but I think it's about that it time uh, where we talk about who we followed on Twitter over the past two months or so. I think that is a good plan. Hooray. So I see some cool stuff here. You want to tell me about it? Yeah. So the first is if up down, what is this wonderful little uh, Twitter account? I don't know. What is that Twitter account? Is does, does that Twitter account really have only one tweet? Yeah. From 2010, yeah. December 16th. You know, oh. but I have to follow it. Hmm. So this is Indeed. this is Ryan's account that and, he doesn't use. And what's really funny is I didn't even know I had this account. <laughs> I had no idea. I think we talked about it after last sh- podcast show. Yeah, I think and so. That's why I followed it. And I think the reason why was because we were enumerating all of our Twitter accounts that we had. Right. Yeah. Well, I think I I think I typed in if up down just to see who owned it, and I found out it was me. <laughs> they make cool shirts uh me and brennan just bought one the other day that was mm-hmm. uh let me link to it it's, yeah, it's the it, oh Matt atp Matt. has shirts as well we should get shirts what, what they have shirts now yeah what? link 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 they're cool um i don't know if i it's atp.fm slash shirt um I didn't think that. Oh, it's kind of nice. I really like the M5 one. Which, which, wait, what M5? So the the, the, the rainbow one. That's the a one. reference to the BMW M5. Okay. Uh, how do you that know makes that? Sense, then. Yeah. I I know things about cars occasionally. How 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 is that even possible? He's Brandon. He knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's so weird. No, it's it's awesome. See, so at some point you guys should watch the British car show uh, Top Gear, which is an awful slash amazing show. Huh? Occasional clips here and there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it's, it's really fun. And you learn a bunch of random stuff about cars. Um, but I have to say um, that ATP one is really awesome because it uses the same sort of style as as the BMW M5 uh, or the, the M series kind of logos do. But it also has the a- Apple six colors there. So it, yeah, I, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to buy one of these for me for my birthday. Yeah, I think I might have to do that. Uh, the, all the, and it is, I, I do like the, the one below it. I won't get that one, but the one below it is pretty funny. Yeah, yep. Okay, so I will also link here in the show notes the shirt that me and Brandon bought, which is the Close Mini Max, Mini Maxi, which is the window decorations for closing minimizing and maximizing windows on OS 10. Yep. And finally, I follow Internet of <laughs> which is a good feed for uh, Internet of Things devices that are just kind of crazy and thoughts on the modern state of technology. For sure. Yes, that's a really fun one. I'd, I'd seen, I think, it was Swift on Security tweeting about it a lot, so I'm like, okay, I should, I should probably follow it and enjoy the other 103,000 people who do Yep, I feel. So what's this, Ryan? I see you've added three Twitter accounts. Yeah, here. I, I just, I just, um, yeah, I did. Uh, I also <laughs> just noticed that uh, Brian actually did what I told him, and he, um, made, you know, got Tech four seven eight nine again, and he put the X over the the the, the old avatar. Mm-hmm. I did. Yeah, I, I did that. I think right after the show, and then actually, I think. Uh, the Twitter account was suspended because it detected the the logo and stuff. Oh. So I had to verify that it was my account. I see. <laughs> well, that's pretty cool. Okay, so uh, let's find out who these people I just put in here are. So Herman J. Rad K. the third could be a person. Allegedly is the VP of Engineering at Nordstrom Rack. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I saw him at Signal last year. He's cool. And so that's pretty cool. Uh, but I think the reason I followed him is because he likes to talk about Rust. And anybody mm-hmm. that likes to talk about Rust or speak at Rust or do anything involving Rust is a friend of mine. Yeah. Do you follow Ian Whitney? Uh, I, I don't, but I could. Do it. I'll, I'll add him, too, because he, he's a, a good friend of mine and he's very interested in Rust. Rust uh, is, is good for everyone. He's like Rust, Ruby. He's everything. He is just 100% pure awesome. Uh, one of his posts about Rust, I think I shared in the Slack, um, it got up on the Hacker News thing. Um, 
and I think it was on the uh, R R programming. It, it got pretty high up there too as well. So, yeah, he's a cool he's a cool cat. One of my coworkers, um, friend of the show, Max Fierke, um knows him probably better than I do. But generally, he is just a cool person. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. So let's see, who else did I did I uh, add here? So I also added Scala Native. So Scala has a native version now. It's not com- totally feature complete yet, so you can't do everything you can do with regular Scala. But if you haven't heard, Scala is a language that runs on top of the JVM, and it can leverage any Java library, which is pretty fancy. Mm. But one of the problems is, as mentioned, it runs on top of the JVM. Well, what if you wanted to use your favorite language, which is Scala, but, <laughs> but you know, like, not with the JVM, you know, like on an actual computer without, you know, polluting it with Java? Well, mm-hmm. you might be able to sometime in the future use Java uh, Scala native, which, is just, which will be really quite cool. So it, it doesn't take any additional startup time. It just is native. Uh, so you can follow the Twitter and the GitHub, which is really quite fancy. Pretty, pretty big mm-hmm. fan. Uh, nice. and, and then, of course, going along in my language-ness here, I also decided to follow Elixir Lang. And so if you haven't seen Elixir, Elixir is another language, which also is pretty pretty neat. And um, I can't really tell you too much about it because I don't really know it, but it, it just... It's built on Erlang. Yeah, it, it, you know, it's it's one of those that. new old languages again, and it, it looks really nice. Um, it, ha- it has some cool... Um, functional programming aspects that are nice, but also it has a fairly nice and well-defined process and threading model. Do I hear another war game? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You hear, you hear the, the signs to come. (laughs) That's awesome. That is awesome. Yep. Well, for, for my, uh, Twitter follow follows this, uh, this month, uh, I've got three. The first one is Bodega Cats, which is exactly what it sounds like. Cats hanging out in convenience stores and gas stations. Sometimes <laughs> wow. I actually have pictures of dogs, too. It's really adorable. That is amazing. Yeah. Um, we share these around the office uh, an inordinate amount of times because, let's be honest, who doesn't want to see cats hanging out in a convenience store? Well, maybe not a convenience store that would actually like to buy something from, but in the abstract, cats in convenience stores are pretty neat. Um, the next one is underscore soaps, who is a UI kit frameworks engineer at Apple, and therefore is immediately deserving of all the high fives and Twitter followers. Um, and then finally, uh, Chris Davies, C underscore Davies on Twitter, who is uh, a journalist at, um, uh, I'm going to get it wrong because I didn't look at it immediately, slash gear. Okay, cool. Um, and uh, is both bespectacled and British, so therefore he and I are immediately best friends. Um because British people are cool. I love yeah, this I tweet. Can... Deeply disappointed the much rumored Google Harp wasn't announced at I.O. <laughs> Is Google See, doomed without me. a string instrument? Oh, that was so fun. See, that's me. That's, that's <laughs> me right there. That was great. Google Harp forever. Yeah. Well, uh, and that's kind of my whirlwind three follows. I have two quick things to say here at the okay. end. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, Forgot the second one, but the first one is Twitter now has 140 characters without links and mentions, I think, right? So tweets can I thought be it was, long. I thought it was still forthcom- forthcoming. Well, yes, but soon to come. Okay. I don't remember what else I was going to say. I am looking forward to that. I know, I am too. And everyone who writes for social media immediately said, yay, with 150 exclamation points. You know, I think you know, it's the the easiest way to increase the amount of characters in a tweet without really breaking much of anything because it's a little longer but not that much longer but it doesn't also it doesn't really break up the workflow of anyone you know i when when they do this though i wonder how long it'll take clients to to update because you know there are some old clients that will never get updated and for years they will continue to work somehow but the their their counter will always be a little bit off Mm -hmm. it probably won't let you tweet Unless it's to the old style. But I bet I'm sure Tweetbot will be updated as soon as it becomes the thing. Probably. Mm-hmm. Twitter effect probably too. Yeah. Yeah. All the good ones. Well, it, it's always great to do a pod kit with everyone here. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll have to do this again sometime. Sometime soon. Now that we're now that summer is happening, you two are all out in the real world. Uh, You're going too. I, yeah, I'll, I'll be there eventually. Yeah. I'll catch up with you guys. Yeah. You, 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 don't, you don't get to leave. 
no, not one bit, not one bit. But um, but yeah, it'll be cool. I think we'll be able to do this uh, on a more consistent schedule in the future, which will be pretty darn neat. I was looking back last summer. We did it weekly. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's when we all had all sorts of free time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And as I'm only working for one employer instead of two to three to four, um, <laughs> it, this 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 might be easier too. So maybe. Yeah. Could. So well, where can we find everyone on the internet this week? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at Randomar, and of course, on my favorite website, Contextual.link. <laughs> you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at underscore Brian Mitchell underscore, and at my newly updated website, Brianm.me, which will shortly have a new blog post about my time on Tech Group. Cool. All right, and you can find me this week... Uh, nowhere in particular, but uh, except for perhaps San Francisco, uh, I will probably be posting social media updates on Twitter, where I'm Brandon underscore MN, or Instagram, where I am the exact same name. Uh, Instagram is probably where most coffee pictures end up, so if you're down for coffee pictures, that's the place to find them. What about just Otherwise, regular pictures? Regular pictures? Um, maybe those will probably also be on Instagram, Aww. but uh, Twitter's probably the best bet. Yes! Uh, Otherwise, you can catch me on my blog, which, I, as I've mentioned previously, I basically don't write on uh, at brandon.mn. If you want to see my old portfolio page, you can go to brndn.xyz and catch it all there because I didn't bother to update the DNS and probably never will. Um, so if, if, you, if you like that old version better, uh, you can do that, too. That sounds very good. You bet. Well, it's been fun. It has. It has been. Uh, I guess we'll see you perhaps next week. Until next time. Maybe. Have a good one. Yep.